Good morning. Let us start with the greetings and announcements from our bulletin. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which can never be shaken, never be moved. Lord, do good to those who are good, who choose to obey your commands. We have some announcements this morning. I'm obviously not Ken Applegate. Um, I'm Barbara Beal, an elder here at First Presbyterian Church. Ken is away um, for the weekend um, visiting his family, and so we wish him well on his trip. The bulletin has a number of announcements. Um, the first and one of the most exciting ones is that there's a small group study starting in October, reading the book by Adam Hamilton called Why. There's sign-ups in the Prime Room after church. It will begin October 3rd, and there will be two different days each week um, that you can come, one or the other. There's Sundays in between the 8 o'clock and this service, and then there's also Wednesdays at a time to be determined. Um, I was told there's a Red Cross blood drive for Saturday, September 18th from 9 to 1 o'clock, and sign up will be downstairs um, today after church. Next Sunday is big opening comeback, welcome back Sunday here at First Pres. There will be communion at an 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock service. All are welcome, and we hope you'll attend that exciting time. And finally, I have some sad news. Um, Bob Westcott passed away on Wednesday night. This isn't in the bulletin because the bulletin had already been printed. And so we hope that you'll keep the Westcott family in your prayers. Is there anything, any other announcements that I missed? If not, let us worship music, or let us worship God.
Our responsive call to worship is from Proverbs 22. If you have to choose between a good reputation and great wealth, choose a good reputation. The rich and poor have this in common, the Lord made them both. If you plant the seeds of injustice, disaster will spring up and your oppression of others will end. Be generous and share your food with the poor you will be blessed for it. Don't take advantage of the poor just because you can. Don't take advantage of those who stand helpless in court. The Lord will argue their case for them and will threaten the life of anyone who threatens theirs. If we say we are without sin, we aren't fooling anybody. The blessed thing about the church is that we are not alone. We are here with our brothers and sisters who love us, and with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they also love us. Resting in that assurance, let us confess our sins together. Most gracious Lord, we confess today that we've been holding on to some things too tightly. Fear, distrust, grudges, hurt, and anger. We confess that we've been sharing some things away too easily, like gossip, malice, callousness, disdain, and apathy. We confess we've been hoarding our beautiful gifts of time, talents, treasure, and love our mindset, our heart space, and our priorities are backwards, upside down, and at cross purposes with your will. Please tuck us under your wing and help us find your peace. Give us fresh hope, fresh visions, fresh thoughts. Then send us back out into the world where we pray we might serve as your disciples in loving, energetic, and imaginative ways. For we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, lift up your heads and hear the good news. Quoting from the last verse of hymn 332, it is written, Live into hope of captives freed from chains of fear or want or greed. God now proclaims our full release to faith and hope and joy and peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare we are forgiven. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. Then Jesus left and went away to the territory near the city of Tyre. He went into a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, but he could not stay, stay hidden. 
A woman whose daughter had an evil spirit in her heard about Jesus and came to him at once and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile born in the region of Phoenicia in Syria. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus answered, let us first feed the children. It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Sir, she answered, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. So Jesus said to her, because of that answer, go back home where you will find that the demon has gone out of your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed. The demon had indeed gone out of her. Jesus then left the neighborhood of Tyre and went on through Sidon to Lake Galilee, going by way of the territory of the Ten Towns. Some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. So Jesus took him off alone, away from the crowd, put his fingers in the man's ears, spat and touched the man's tongue. Then Jesus looked up to heaven, gave a deep groan, and said to the man, Ephatha, which means open up. At once, the man was able to hear, his speech impediment was removed, and he began to talk about without any trouble. Then Jesus ordered the people not to speak of it to anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they told it. And all who heard were completely amazed. How well he does everything, they exclaimed. He even causes the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from the book of James, second chapter, verses 1 through 17. Listen for what God's spirit might be saying to you today. My brothers and sisters, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearances. Suppose a rich man comes in wearing a gold ring and fine claws to your meeting and a poor man in ragged clothes also comes. If you show more respect to the well-dressed man and say to him, have this best seat here, but say to the poor man, stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet, then you are guilty of creating distinctions among yourselves and of making judgments based on evil motives. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you dishonor the poor. Who are the evil ones who oppress you and drag you before judges? The rich, they are the ones who speak evil of that good name which has been given to you. You will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom which is found in scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you treat people according to their outward appearances, you are guilty of sin, and the law condemns you as a lawbreaker. Whoever, commits, whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. For the same one who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Even if you do not commit adultery, you become a lawbreaker if you commit murder speak and act as people who will be judged by the law that sets us free. For God will not show mercy when he judges people who have not been merciful, but mercy triumphs over judgment. My brothers and sisters, what good is it for someone to say that he or she has faith if their actions do not prove it? Can that faith save them? Suppose there are brothers and sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in saying, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and do not have actions, then it is dead. Thanks be to God for the reading and hearing of these words. 
Before we begin, let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. After Reverend Applegate asked me to preach this weekend, I read the lectionary. I called Ken back and said, really? Really? I feel like God's scolding us a little bit here, especially that readings from James. I feel like God is telling us to go up to our rooms and sit for a little while and think about things. So maybe in the service, after the readings, we could just sort of sit in silence for a little while and think about things rather than having me preach a sermon. Ken replied, no, that's really usually not the way it works very well for us Presbyterians. Following the lectionary is one of the greatest challenges to preaching the good news. It's also one of the best disciplines and a place of grace. Following the lectionary makes the preacher and the congregation confront the biblical word and apply it to the life before them. And it's a chance to explore more deeply the message of the word that might not be apparent on first blush. Our gospel reading from, Mark, from chapter seven in the book of Mark are two stories of healing. The first is the story of the Gentile woman with a demonically possessed daughter. And the second is the healing of the deaf mute. To get to this place in Mark, we need to recall that the first six chapters of this gospel tell of Jesus preaching in the synagogues, performing many miracles, teaching in Galilee, answering the Pharisees' questions with parables, and feeding 5,000 people with bread and fish. Still, Jesus has been rejected by many leaders of his own faith community, and maybe worst of all, his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. In today's reading, we find Jesus traveling first in Tyre, an area with mostly Jewish and Gentile communities, and then an area around Galilee, mostly populated by Gentiles. And after everything has happened, Jesus must have been frustrated and tired. Never a moment's peace. Despite his prayers and his hard work, his disciples and his faith community just don't get it. They just don't get it. And so Jesus wants to move through this area in secret, maybe seeking an opportunity to regroup and recharge and not cause a stir. But even here, it's impossible. So when a Gentile woman comes before him, lays herself at his feet, and asks Jesus to heal her daughter, Jesus is not his usual divine loving self. I think Jesus explains in a rather off-putting, crass, and human way that he's called to feed the children the bread. In other words, to perform miracles for the children of Israel. And it would be wrong for Jesus to, quote, throw the children's food to the dogs. Remember that movie when Harry met Sally and the who is the dog scene at the wedding? Let me refresh your memory and set the stage. Harry and Sally have broken up, but still must serve as best man and maid of honor at their couple's friend's wedding. Sally's a little bit standoffish when Harry tries to make small talk, and so Harry asks Sally if the breakup's going to affect their relationship forever. Sally, forever? It just happened. Harry, it happened three weeks ago. You know how a year to a person is like seven years to a dog? Sally, is one of us supposed to be a dog in this scenario? Harry, Sally, who's the dog? Harry, you are. Sally, I am, I am, I am the dog. The scene ends with a big fight in a kitchen of the banquet hall and an embarrassing toast of Harry and Sally by the groom. So Harry makes a big mistake here by not looking at this scenario from Sally's standpoint and by not letting go of his you are the dog argument. Just saying. So what was that Syrian woman thinking lying there at the feet of Jesus when Jesus all but calls her a dog? 
Was she offended? Did she have to take a deep breath and swallow her anger so as to not ask Jesus, who is the dog in this scenario? Was her eye on the prize? Healing for her daughter and nothing else mattered. Or maybe the Holy Spirit was flowing around the divine human being standing above her. It was so strong that the retort quickly entered her mind and popped out of her mouth. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. Even the dogs under the children's table eat the leftovers. The children's scraps lying on the floor, the dried Cheerios, bits of half-eaten bagel, and assorted detritus spilled from the children's high chair tray. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. A true believer's response recorded for all eternity. I think the dialogue paused as Jesus considered her response. In this pause, did Jesus' mind flip perceptions from a human-centered perception focused on his own problems, focused on how he saw this woman as the other, a dog? Did Jesus' mind flip to a divine place where he could see the world from this woman's perspective, from this woman's viewpoint, a human, a woman who cared so much for her daughter that she was willing to take an insult lying down, a faithful woman full of desperation and concern for her child, even greater. In this response, did Jesus perceive her as the beloved, the thou to to his eye, a woman with sharp intellect and sly wit, matched equally to his own? Whatever happened in that pause, Jesus replies, because of your answer, go back home where you will find that the demon has gone out of your daughter. In love, Jesus gave this woman way more than scraps off the floor. He gave her a miracle. And this is Jesus' first miracle for a Gentile in the Gospel of Mark. A miracle for someone who started out as a dog and who, in a moment of divine recognition and love, ended the story as the mother of the cured daughter. The second story in Mark is also a miraculous healing. Themes from Mark are prominent in the healing of the deaf mute. The story is told quickly. The request is made to not go and tell anyone but keep this a secret. And the story is clearly told for the benefit of people outside of the Jewish faith as demonstrated by the translation given for the Aramaic word meaning open up. Deeper still, the story is where Jesus had an important encounter alone with this man, a man who could see Jesus but could not hear or speak. And Jesus musters up all of his energy and tells the man to open up. And then the man could hear and speak with no trouble and immediately began talking. And I wonder what Jesus learned listening to this man speak after so many years of silent observations. The group of people who saw this miracle from afar began saying, How well he does everything. He makes even the deaf hear and the dumb speak. Making the deaf hear and the dumb speak points to the book of Isaiah and common Masonic signs of the time. The deaf man, deaf mute man and the community of his friends, outsiders from Jesus' normal faith community, are the ones who first raise the possibility that Jesus is the Messiah in the book of Mark. The epistle reading from James is a charge to find delight and divinity in people who are not like ourselves, and then to channel that discovery into loving action. Doing this involves following Christ's two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul and with all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Because if we know we're loved by God, and if we love God back, then the only thing we can do is love our neighbor, showing that love through action. But this is easier said than done, isn't it, in the real world? We, the members of First Presbyterian Church, love this church so much. And in our love for this church, we want to do the right things here in this church. And each of us think we know what those right things are. And in our certainty, and our, we would be wise to pause and check whether we are that smart, resourceful, and self-reliant humans if we've shut out the divine. Such human ways of thinking and acting can cause trouble and conflict with others in the congregation who are equally certain that they have the right answers of what ought to be done. And in our collective, right things should be sought through God's visions. We're called to tap into God's agape love, his divine love and power and knowledge graced upon this community of faith when it's sought in prayer and love and thoughtful discernment. We, the congregation of First Presbyterian Church, love this church so much on our fellow congregants. We have a lovely faith and meaningful I thou relationships with our brothers and sisters here in Christ. And so it can be difficult to reach out to strangers who come into this church, especially when they're different than us. Open up and see with Christ's eyes. Is it intimidating to walk into this church as a stranger? Is it difficult? to find an opening where one might fit in this tightly knit community? What unique gifts or insights does a person from the outside of these walls bring into us? How can we reflect Christ's love of this beloved person back to them, bringing the love of God full circle? And it's even more difficult for us to reach out to people outside of these walls and ask them in, but we're called to share God's love graced upon us here with those we encounter outside of here through meaningful actions that form human connections. And that way we tie our community into the larger community of Glens Falls. And in this way, love's, God's love is returned full circle back into this congregation. I close the sermon with these words. There are notes from a theology course I took at Princeton a few years ago scraps of paper from the bottom of a bookshelf near the floor. They point to the miracles of the good news in the message from today. Quote, see yourself as an object of God's delight. Become a God bearer, learning to see others in the same way. The other is equally embraced and loved by the delight of God. Ethical imperatives to love the other fall short. Only through God and our knowledge of God's love for us and the other can we hope to follow suit. Under the banner of love, the continents of the earth changes and duty is turned into delight. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us gather our hearts together in a spirit of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for these last beautiful yet bittersweet summer days. The last sweet pops of summer corn eaten off the cob for brilliant sunsets, cooling evenings, the slowing of the cricket's call, the immense evening sky filled with stars and galaxies and the wonders of your handiwork that help us understand or see the mystery of being both small and yet beloved by you. Dear Lord, as we thank you for these gifts, we pray for those that are so burdened down that they don't have time or energy to consider the mysteries. People battered by hurricanes, people who have lost everything to fire, people in Afghanistan and elsewhere hurt by war and injustice, healthcare providers, and the people who need them. Families who have lost loved ones. People who don't feel like they fit in this world. People scarred by mental illness, poverty, loneliness, fear. People with locked hearts and minds and souls. We pray for people who are hurting. We pray for their release from suffering by a warm meal, a kind word, help, love, actions. We pray for changes to powers and principalities that keep systems in place, to keep people in their place. And dear Lord, when we say the Lord's Prayer, we pray that thy will be done. Today we pray this for ourselves. Give us the courage to mean it when we pray the words, the discernment to understand a small part of your will, the vision to see what could be done, and the courage to do it, to bring the love shown in Christ to a hurting and needing world. Now let us be bold to approach the throne of grace and say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I end the service with a poem from Mary Oliver called Logos. Why wonder about the loaves and fishes? If you say the right words, the wine expands. If you say them with love and the felt ferocity of that love, the fish explode into many. Imagine him speaking and don't worry what is reality or what is plain or what is mysterious. If you were there, it was all those things. If you can imagine it, it is all those things. So eat, drink, and be merry. Accept the miracle. Accept, too, each spoken word, spoken with love. Amen.